Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. I am super excited because we have one of my all-time personal favorites, Jack Alato, as we like to call him, Nacho Alato. Um, he is here today to talk honestly, and fa it's fascinating, 10 epic fundraising fails. I wish I knew then that I know now what I might keep seeing around. And so we're going to get into this with the amazing Jack Alato, CFRE, one of the major trainers over at our friends with our friends at Fundraising Academy at National University. We also have one of our new co-hosts with us, Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, joining us today as we get into this really important conversation. You'll be even meeting more of our co-hosts as we are rolling them out over the next several weeks. Wendy, why and don't you talk about our sponsors? Absolutely. None of this is possible without our presenting sponsors. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy, at National University, 180 Management, your part-time controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. We awesome. really appreciate all that they bring. Thank you. Thank you. We do indeed. We do indeed. Jack Alato, CFRE, one of the, the, the brain trusts, I would say, <laughs> over at, at Fundraising Academy as a trainer. So many people, Jack, must know you from your CFRE training modules as well. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people take the CFRE test every year. I, as I mentioned earlier in our pre, pre-talk, so to speak, uh, I have 174, 175 people in this study group. So I'm always excited about it. Uh, it's uh, four Saturdays in a row and uh, they get notes, they get chat. They, they, what I love about it is they form smaller study groups mm -hmm. where some of those smaller study groups from four or five years ago still meet every yes. other week so it's it's that camaraderie that mm -hmm. esprit de corps that ability to chat with each other similar to what we do on the nonprofit show mm -hmm. to talk to each other about mm -hmm. things that are concern or issues that we need to deal with in our career i love it and it just really um is, is such an important thing and again if you joined us in the green room chatter we were specifically talking about a presentation that Jack and Angela Barnes continued uh, from a conversation we had on the nonprofit show. They mm -hmm. presented at uh, Icon in Toronto, and it's really, I'm going to say it stirred the soup. It yes, did. it did. Yeah, it's stirring it, and that's good. It's it okay to stir the soup. We have to question our practices yeah. and look at some of the problems that some of our practices bring about. Right. It's what makes us better. It's That's what right. makes us better. I yep. agree. Well, let's talk about what can make us better. Fail number one, failure to have a strategic development and marketing plan or plans, plural. What does that look like, Jack? So I think plans are a tool of management and good managers need plans. Mm -hmm. And they need plans because a plan is a roadmap. A plan is the future focus. You know, we talk about future focus in cost selling quite a bit at the Fundraising Academy. A plan gives us a future focus, where we're going to go. I like to say every organization at a minimum needs three important plans. And the first of those plans is a strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, Julia and Wendy, this is where you outline your mm. activities, your programs, the things you want to do. If you're going to have a capital campaign down the road, you're going to put that and outline that in your strategic plan. Mm -hmm. The strategic plan is the foundation of the next plan. And the next plan is the development plan. I think, and Wendy and Julia, maybe you've seen this in your own career. Sometimes we think, oh, we've got to get that development plan first. No, you need the strategic plan. Because the development plan yeah. looks at those activities and programs in the strategic plan and says, how are we going to fund them? What's the benefit to the donor? What vehicles, fundraising vehicles, do we need to, to complete that? The third plan is the marketing plan. And this is where we outline our communication strategies to talk to all of the constituencies about those programs and activities we outlined in the strategic plan and how we are going to fund them 
which we did in the, the development plan. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard a failure to plan is a plan to failure. It's mm -hmm. totally true. We need to have plans. By the way, Julia, I want to say that we're going to be talking over these next few days about 10 fundraising fails. I've committed every single one of these, <laughs> plus another thousand. So, I mean, we could probably do a couple months, guys, when <laughs> fundraising fails that Jack has hit, hit committed. But I know we only have time today for five, the first five. Oh, my God, Jack. I love that. You know, that makes it so real. And I, I really, truly value your approach and your knowledge. And I would say your experience. So talk to Wendy and I about number fail number two, not having a case for support. And I got to say, I feel like this is old school. I feel like a lot of folks are leaving this behind. Yeah. Kind of skipping ahead. Wendy, do you see that? I, I see it. I see it's become this like afterthought or non-thought, like you or said. That. So, yeah. You know, I think the case for support is one of the, again, another foundation of fundraising. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what it is, it's your story. And right. I've written hundreds of these over the course of my career. But a case for support, in my mind, is the rationale underlining why, why? you deserve philanthropic support. That's it. It's not why you need money. It's why you deserve philanthropic support. It's of messages that prepare prospective donors and funders for solicitation. It's really the first step. You know, we talked about plans, the strategic plan. When you have an activity, a program in your strategic plan, you must have a case for support for that activity or plan. What a case for support is and how it helps you, it's a set of arguments that explain why your nonprofit deserves gift support. Mm -hmm. It's an accumulation of information, the parts of which argue for philanthropic support. One of the things that I love about a case for support, if you really put some time and effort into that case for support, you write a wonderful case for support, you are gonna be able to use that over and over again. You're gonna take copy from that case for support and put it in your annual campaign letter. You're gonna put parts of that in your foundation grant. You're gonna have it in your newsletter, in your annual report. I can't tell you the number of things that really, really it helps do. It need, it's, it answers, it's a case statement, a, a case for support tells all that needs to be told, answers all the important questions, reviews all the arguments for support and explains the proposed plan for raising money. It is such an important document. And if you have no, nothing else to do, go out, Google it. You'll find some templates online on how to write a case for support. There's a lot of great information. It, it's, that. oh my gosh. When I think about one of the things that scares us most is doing the ask or what I love to call the invitation. That case of, for support is Absolutely. really what puts you out there and says, there's a reason why it it just opens that conversation. So you, I, foundational, like you said. I love Absolutely. it. Okay. One and two are good, Jack. I mean, I'm impressed so far. I don't want to like, it up. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to like say it's all downhill from now because I'm so impressed with the first two. But now mm. let's talk about having no strategies for prospect research. Yeah. You know, a simple truth is no prospects, no donors. That's it. Okay. And I think every organization has to ask itself, what strategies are we going to use to acquire donors? And in cost selling, we actually have quite a number of strategies that we use in prospect research to find prospects. The first thing is ask your board members. Ask, ask your other major gift donors. One of the things that I used to do in my own career when I was a major gift officer, when I met with somebody who was going to make a major gift, I would always ask him, do you know anyone in your circle, in your network, who might be interested in supporting our organization's mission. 
And if they said yes, not only did I get the name of a prospective donor, but I also had a linkage to that person in that major gift donor. And my next question would be to that major gift donor, could you connect me? Perhaps the two of us could meet with that prospective donor for coffee or lunch, et cetera. The second way I think to find major gift donors is to ask your volunteers. Ask your volunteers, and of course, board members are volunteers, but if there are other volunteers, ask them about who they might know who might be interested in, in um, the mission, in the vision, in the values of your organization. And the third most, I always say this in my CFRA study groups, Rosso's concentric circles. It's so elegant. It's one of the most beautiful tools that we have in fundraising. And it's a great way to start prospecting. You start in the center of those concentric circles and you work out. Beautiful way to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to me like it's a natural way to go, Jack. And also, Wendy, I'd love to get your feedback on this. And that is that it's not just about raising money. It's about building community support that then leads into other aspects that circles back around, I think, a lot of times to money. So absolutely. There's no doubt. It's at the core of who we are. Relationship. It's the relationship building, right? That's our front line. Eagles fly with eagles. So, and now they feel more invested beyond their dollars. Oh, yeah. they, they, you know, this major gift officer, this person speaking to me on behalf of the organization wants my help, wants to know who I know. And so it, it really just tightens everything up. It's that's the wonderful thing about it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Wendy, I think you nailed it with that. But, you know, if you ask your major donors for advice, it's like, who do you know, kind of thing. You know what they say? When you ask for advice, you get money. When you ask for money, you get advice. You probably guys have probably heard that. So I'm a big person who likes to ask for advice. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. That's the great way. And especially, you know, major, I mean, no, we're going to talk about major donors, I think tomorrow or later today, but major donors are investors. We ask our investors, they're owners. They build the organization. We ask them, hey, help us. Help us find other investors. That's right. right. That's right. And, you know, I think that kind of goes on to this next piece. And it's it's really, I, I do want to spend a little bit more time on this because mm. no understanding of a donor's motivation. And I think a lot of times, Jack, at least in the round, the conversations I've had in my community, it's like, well, who has the deepest pockets? Mm -hmm. That's where we start. And then, mm. we, you know, you don't hear about like, yeah, they're really passionate about this issue or they, you know, are directly impacted. Or I don't know. We just go after the checkbook size, right? No. Or the wallet size. You know, I, I think there are many motivations and I mean, we could touch on some of them, but one of the most important motivations I think of when we talk about it in cost selling is intrinsic motivations, which mm -hmm. are motives that prompt us to make a gift because of our shared values. If you, your donor believes that the value of ending homelessness in your community is an important thing and they're motivated to make a gift, then you're going to have a great match. What other things motivate donors? Some donors believe they, they are changing someone's love or by extension, they are changing the community and society or the world. In cost selling, mm -hmm. we refer to these mo motivated donors as impact investors. I said this earlier, in, you know, major donors are people who believe in investing in the community. They want to make sure that they do it. They trust your organization to use their gift for the public good. Donors whose values align to your nonprofit, these are value-driven donors. And we need to find more value-driven donors because it's such a beautiful sweet spot when we match their values with our organization's values. There are donors who are interested in tax deductions, but I think that's less of a thing. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. changed the, the laws around tax deductions. Yeah. There are those that want to build their social network. I met many donors 
who wanted to get into a room with other major donors because they were looking for clients or, or customers or whatever it is. Some are motivated by emotions, by the story that you tell them about the people who you serve in your community. Some want to memorialize somebody. I met a donor once who said to me, you know, when I was a child, Jack, my mother read to me and I want to memorialize her by creating mm. an endowment at a library where we could buy books for children. That's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment that that gentleman expressed to me. So we, we, he wanted to memorialize and honor his deceased mom. You know, it's just really a great place to find people or altruistic motivations, wanting the world to be a better place. One of the things that I read in researching this question, here's the 85% of people who make a gift. Why do you think they make a gift, guys? Because someone asked them. Asked them. Right. So they're motivated because someone asked them. Don't ask, you don't get you yeah, know, and yeah. it just happens. And I found many organizations who just never ask. They do everything else, but not ask. Here's the thing about the cost selling cycle. During need discovery, we develop a questioning strategy by asking open-ended questions, some closed-ended questions, but mostly open-ended questions that enable us to get to what motivates them, what will motivate them to make a gift. For me, that is one of the most beautiful parts of the cost selling cycle, asking those open-ended questions. That, you know, Wendy mentioned the word relationship, which always gives me goosebumps, okay? Building relationships with donors. That's where you build relationships, yes. right there. So Jack, let me, you know, today is a drill down day. Let's drill down. Is it ever okay to say, what motivates you? I mean, like literally mm -hmm. use that word yeah, and so that you can learn from that. Yeah. And, you know, what beautiful things. there's my dogs are barking their brains up. I hope you guys are. Okay. No, we're good. It's so good. good. So um, here's one of the things that's so beautiful about my own work experience. I took this interim development position for uh, a mental health organization. And one of the things that people told me, um, I remember a woman said to me, I'm on this board. I'm motivated to give to this organization because my son is out there mm. on the streets because he neglected to take his medication. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I make a gift to this organization and they're outreaching to the homeless community, well, people who have PTSD or, or mental health problems, yeah. they might impact him in some small way. To me, I remember when I heard that, I was ready to cry, honestly. Okay. But it's a motivation because they know that there's that potential that someone they love, for whatever reason, who they've lost that contact with, can benefit by giving to a mental health organization. Wow. It just... I, I just love the motives. You know, Julia, you and I have talked in the past about the role of fundraisers. We're like clergy. We're like yes. people who get information about wealth and yes. personal things. And that is a mm -hmm. sacred responsibility. It is. It is. To, to cherish those things that donors tell us. They tell us the most intimate things about their lives. Yeah. I, I agree. I think we cover their motivations right there. You know, I think, Jack, I love that you said that because I think as a community fundraiser, um, as a very young woman, when I was asked to start to do this in my community, I think that was like my biggest shock is that people would say things to me and, mm -hmm. and it was like, holy moly, it made it sacred. It made yeah. it more, um, not, I'm just, I'm not just asking for a check. It, for me, it it made me so much more committed to the organization because I I realized that it was, yeah. you know, a sacred reaction yeah. to sacred. generally yeah. somebody's life that they had not always shared. Yeah, it was not always public, 
And, you know, and it was told in confidence or privacy, you know, in, in private so that you were expected to, you know, trust yeah. that, that interaction. Um, fascinating. I, I'm so appreciative that you said that. And I know we've got to jump on to number five because our time, but yeah. I wanted to, before we just to say, if we don't ask those things, then we can fill in the blanks for them. And that would be horrible. Just the opposite of what we just right. said Being in that yeah. sacred space. Now, if we leave it open-ended and we're not in, we're going to fill that motivation in with something and that would be horrible. So, so yeah. important. I love that. That's, that's really a great way uh, to, to think about that, Wendy. I, again, I'm like thrilled that you brought that up. Now we talked about planning. We talked about the failure to plan. We talked mm -hmm. about planning to fail because you don't have a plan. Yeah. Talk about this because you're talking about all the way through, right? Not just the ask, but cultivating, yeah. asking, and then stewardship. I think a lot of times yes. we forget. And Wendy, I see you going, yeah, we mm -hmm. get the check and then we're on to the next thing. Big mistake. Right. Yeah. You know, the first question, when I see this question, the first thing I want everybody listening or watching the nonprofit show to ask themselves, what is a major donor to them? And I'm not talking about the amount of the gift. I'm talking understanding why someone would make a major gift to your organization. What great, what would make somebody want to be that investor? And I'll tell you something else. You know, it's a question that each organization must ask so that they can understand before they could cultivate, before they could acquire, before they could solicit, and before they could steward, steward uh, a major gift donors. It's major gift donors who make nonprofit organizations possible. They're the investors, as we said. They're the owners. Every single major program in any organization I've worked for was primarily made by gifts from major mm -hmm. gift donors. Mm -hmm. They pushed the organization to advance its mission in so many different ways. They launch new program initiatives. They transform your physical plan. They endow vital components. But here's the best way to, to find them. Most of the major donors that you have right now are already in your database, guys. Mm. They're already there. You just have to yes. figure out how to find them. 95% of contributions to your organization are going to come from those major gift donors. You've heard of the Pareto principle, I'm sure. It's really important. Where do they come? I don't know of any major gift donor who doesn't come through your annual campaign. Mm -hmm. What they do is they send in a small gift, 100 yes. bucks. 150 bucks. And what they're doing right there is they're testing you. Yeah. They're testing your organization's ability to cultivate them, to solicit them, and most importantly, to steward them. Mm -hmm. That's where they come in through your organization. And I've seen it in every single organization I found. Once they're acquired, once you have them, then you have to cultivate them. You have to bring them closer and closer to your organization by cultivation. Making the ask is a small part, mm. but then a much bigger part is the stewardship point. And you another, know, yeah, I'm sorry. Thing. Go ahead. No, go ahead. 80% of the major gift donors report in, in recent studies as being volunteers first. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, Jack, I love that you said that because, Wendy, I don't know about you, but I come across so many organizations that have a policy, a policy that they will not ask volunteers to engage right. in, in, you know, any type of donation or financial contribution. I don't know if the two of you see that, but I'm always like shocked. Yeah, I have. It is the worst thing. Time talent, then treasure. That's order. It, yeah. I, it's the worst thing when I have seen them. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. you're robbing them. <laughs> you're yeah. robbing them of that yeah. opportunity. Yeah. You know, if you look at the research, people who volunteer give twice as much as people who don't volunteer and their households as a household, the their family 
gives way more mm -hmm. and to more different things. It's just a beautiful thing. Wendy, you couldn't have said it better. We should be asking our volunteers for gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, this is an amazing opportunity. I mean, Jack, I always feel like you bring obviously your credibility and as we say, our, your street cred, but you have this amazing uh, journey that you have led and conducted and had time to reflect about um, with your own asking and your own stewarding and, and, and working on a big team for big institutions. And so I love that you can bring this all together and kind of help us to understand. I also adore you for saying, hey, I've made these plus a lot more. <laughs> that authenticity is what drives it home. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, if, if we don't make mistakes, how do we learn? How do we learn? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, we love learning from you, Jack Alato, CFRE, so many people in the nonprofit sector, really across the globe, not just in our own country, but in North America and, and, and other parts of this planet have really learned from you and, mm -hmm. and been able to achieve this rigorous CFRE standard. And so um, I, I really, it's, you're just a treasure in our sector. And, and, and the beautiful part of this is this is only day one of day two. And so two days, we get a whole nother day and they are extremely different from today as well. I mean, different things, but yet they, I can see how, you know, they all weave together to make us more successful. So thank Absolutely. you, Jack. Thank you. It's been remarkable. Hey, Wendy, I'm gonna let you, I mean, you did a yep. beautiful job bringing people in. Let's take them out. Let's let's take it home. We couldn't, uh, thank you so much, Jack, absolutely. And we do also need to make sure we're thanking our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Not possible without them. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm amazing. You know, every day we end with this message. And today I'm thinking about how mm. we need to be, you know, staying well with our knowledge and our approaches so that we can do well. And so the message I want to end with today as we end every day goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you, you two. We'll see you back Thank here you. tomorrow, Thank everyone. You.